right, so we are back in our study of trustworthiness. And see, this is lesson eight. Notice I've decided to <laughs> add to my numbering instead of going 7B. Sort of, I don't know. We're probably on lesson about 12 or so by now. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just the review section. What do we know about God? We only know what God tells us. Uh, he tells it to us either through the creation, which displays his handiwork, or he tells us through the scriptures, which records his words as he led the spirit, or he led the prophets and the apostles uh, to, to deliver it to us. And so that's how we know anything about God. And recently we discussed uh, these characteristics of God, his veracity, uh, his truthfulness, his uh, omniscience, which is necessary for him to be truthful because he, because he knows everything and he's never deceived. We talked about his omnipotence and so he's always able to deliver on all he promised. So his, anything he says is so. And then his clarity, communicating the truth understandably. That doesn't mean that we understand everything that he says, but that we understand enough of what he says that we can trust what he is saying to us. All right. We've been talking then last week, Jesus and trustworthiness, and this is the second session in that. What Jesus said about the Old Testament demonstrates what he believed about it, and what Jesus believed about the Old Testament has to matter to believers. That's Leighton Talbert saying that. So the goals of this lesson are not to prove what Jesus believed about the Old Testament, but rather demonstrate Jesus' confidence in the trustworthiness of God's words. So last week we talked about the, uh, the assumptions about God's Old Testament words. So the historical reliability of Scripture. Jesus cited all of these people and places and events and spoke of them as having actually happened. So the underlying assumption of Jesus' words are these words are God's words. Then his teaching about God's Old Testament words. So uh, we used a couple of examples. God's, uh, God will do exactly everything he has said, Matthew 5.18. God's words are irrefutable. So that is, uh, those are the two categories we were looking at last week. This time, we're going to begin a look at the usage of God's Old Testament words, how Jesus used them. And... Um, we will, uh, we're going to look at various different events. I've got, uh, uh, you know, this is again, one, this is one of those lessons where I wasn't quite sure where to stop, but I thought I stopped at the right place. We'll see. Okay, so before we get into that, is there anything from the previous week or anything that anybody had a question or a comment on that they would like to, they feel like I have missed or should have said, or maybe you could, would elucidate anything at all? All right, so here we go. In temptation, the use of God's words in temptation. Of course, we're looking at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Now, I'm not, gonna put, I'm not putting the whole outline in, our, um, in the slides today. So we're going to be looking from outline to screen. I'm mostly putting scripture, not entirely. But we're going to just survey the temptation. Now, this is, we're following the, uh, the words that are found in Matthew 4. The temptation is also mentioned in Mark uh, somewhere. I can't quite remember what chapter it is. And it's also in Luke 4. In Luke 4, uh, the third and the second temptation are reversed in, in order. Uh, it's not really important which order they came in, I don't think. But we're just going to follow the way it is in Matthew. All right, so here's the first temptation, the first word. Of course, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. Satan says to him, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. All right, and so then Jesus responds, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so after that temptation comes the second, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands... They will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So, um, the, uh, uh, so Satan here himself is quoting scripture, which uh, is in, it provides an insight as well. But then, uh, on the other hand, Jesus says, It is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
And then the last one is the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus responds, go Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So those are the three temptations that are described and then the three responses. And in those responses, uh, Jesus cites the scriptures in response. Right, so this is he is using this is his usage of the Old Testament in this situation. So uh, we've got a couple of things to discuss here in the notes. So what Jesus did not do, I want you to think about think through this with me. What Jesus didn't do, he didn't offer counter arguments. In other words, so here comes this te uh, temptation. The Lord, the he doesn't try to argue Satan. Uh, with Satan about it. He simply responds with Scripture. All right? And he, he doesn't offer any kind of logical rationale why he shouldn't do what Satan is saying. He's not arguing over the absurdities of the temptation. Uh, there's certain things that he asks them to do that are just foolish. And, and uh, uh, he doesn't argue about that. He just simply replies with Scripture. Uh, he he didn't appeal to his own status or power or argue from his own superior intellect. So it's interesting to think about what Jesus is doing here. He's not engaging Satan at all. He's simply answering with the scripture. He's quoting the Father's words. He leaned not in his own, on his own understanding. He showed a settled commitment to God's words. He determined to let God's words define reality. Okay, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, he sided with God and God's perspective in each situation. So as we think about what Jesus did here, is there anything that comes to mind or anything that you'd like to ask about this experience? All right, so we're, what we're, we're showing then is that Jesus simply relying on the word of God, encountering temptation. Now the next section, we're going to carry on from this, but using what Jesus uh, did as an example, we're going to talk about imitation. How can you use passages like those that follow when under temptation? So for example, and here I'm going to, is that showing up? It's a little dim, but I, I thought it was brighter when I made it. Uh, um, I'm going to give you a scripture and then uh, want you to think about it. How would you use this? Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual services of worship. Can anybody think of a, uh, a way they could use, somebody could use this scripture when faced with temptation? Anybody want to... Give me a, an idea. Go ahead, Rob. Well, I know many years ago when I quit drinking, I found this uh, uh, important to remind myself why uh, it wasn't appropriate, certainly for me, to be drinking. Anyway, right. All I mean, so. Right. Right. Okay. So presenting your bodies to God. Okay. So that, that's very. That's a very literal use, right? You're taking God's word. You're relying on that word to, to. Uh, for your own, uh, for your own spiritual life. All right, so let's look at the next one. Uh, no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So, how about you might use that in some temptation that comes your way? Yes, Christy. Test the spirits. So. Okay, test the spirits. That's another scripture, actually, isn't it? <laughs> but okay, so uh, and why would you do that? We could be deceived. Uh, okay, the temptation itself could look what? Very good. It could look like the right thing to do. Okay, so uh, so we we realize that truth or that er that falsehood can be disguised. So we have to be very careful about what we give ourselves to. So we can use it that way. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. I have about six of these, so you can or seven. I'm not sure. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Right? So what would you say? What's an area or a way that you could use this scripture? This is a prime opportunity for me to get coffee, I'll have to say. <laughs> Colin. Okay. All right. So, yes, we can be, uh, you know, the temptation to pride is very subtle because you can see it in other people, but we're not that way. <laughs> okay, Tola. Yes. Yeah. Can you be where you are tempted to sin against God? Yes, right. When you're tempted, yes, to sin against God. That's right. Okay, anybody else have something? Okay, so let's, oh, Gordon? Okay, to remember the old man, I'm dead. Yeah, I'm dead. Yeah, I'm living for Christ now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's good. All right, so, uh, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for beforehand so that we would walk in them. So, what about this one? Gordon? Well, often when you're talking to somebody who's religious but not saved, yeah, right, they believe that good works, that they're Show me your faith without with your good works, right? Yes. They believe that their good works are how they're saved. Yes. And this, if we are created unto good works. Yes. Okay. Not, not the good works didn't create us. That's right. Okay. Anything else on that though? As as uh, and when we're facing temptation, anybody else have an idea on that one? All right. Well, uh, yes, call it. Yeah, there might be something that we know is right that is not pleasant, right? So, yes, uh, I think right. any time you're going to do something that would not be a good witness for Christ, yeah, and this is saying you got to be so careful because other people are looking, yeah, and if you're going to be the witness for Christ, yeah. then you better be acting Christ-like. Yes, and it's so. Uh, I, I'm tempted to give a. <laughs> An illustration from the news, but there's, there's, you know, it's interesting, you know, that where Jesus talks about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, take the beam out of your own eye, and he's talking about hypocrisy. So there's circumstances that happen where somebody is accusing somebody else, but then found to be doing the very same thing. Now I don't want to mention what I'm talking about. You probably already know, but I don't want to introduce politics into our discussions. So, <laughs> but it's interesting, isn't it? And uh, you know, you can be very self-righteous and accusing other people. You know, but we need to be sure that we're walking right and cleaning up our own life. Yes. Uh, yeah. And at different times, maybe at the workplace, your colleague has seen you not joining them to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Or doing what they feel that is right, but yeah. it's indeed yeah. the wrong thing. Yeah. And then they keep seeing you, and they keep mocking you, and saying you are too holy. Yes, yes, and you know, there's there's a contemporary illustration of that right now too in the hockey world, where there's uh, I I've never liked the Philadelphia Flyers, I have to say, but there's a young man who's playing for them, a Russian young man, who stood up and said, "I'm not going to take part of this uh, gay pride event." He wasn't going to make a big stink about it. He just and I well, good for him. That take, but nobody else has done that. Now I don't know. If, I don't think hockey players are especially religious, most of them. <laughs> okay, but but that shows some character on this young man's part. You know, that's that's pretty tough to do. But that's the kind of thing we are created for good works. So even when the pressure is on to go along with the world, that's what we're created for. So this could this could help us. All right. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. How would you use that one, perhaps? Cullen? I guess when we're suffering, we're always tempted to um, do whatever is expedient to get out of okay. the suffering. And that's not always the right. That's right. So it's, we might want to try to get out of suffering when sometimes God wills for us to suffer. Tola? Yeah, when you've been denied your rights because of Christ. You might want to blame the Lord, right? 
But the t this scripture says this is this is part of what we we can expect. Jesus said the world's going to hate you, right? They, it's been granted. It's been granted. It makes me think of Acts, where they they said they counted themselves worthy yes. to suffer. Yeah. So like when we're being suffering for Christ's sake. Yeah. Enjoy. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Trust the Lord. Saying. Trust yeah. the Lord. Okay. Trust the Lord. Okay. All right. Uh, two more. Colossians one. 3, 1 to 3, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So how might you apply that one? How might you use that in temptation? Yes, sir. We should focus on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. We need to focus on the heavenly race yes. and not necessarily be distracted on the world things. That's right. I get very depressed listening to the news. So if I would set my mind on things above, I would at least survive. <laughs> All right, yes, Tola. And avoid worldliness, that's right. Amen. Yes, Maureen? Well, I was just thinking about this because um, our cousin died recently. Yes. And I was thinking, like, she's just the same age as my sister. Yeah. And I was thinking, what would I be thinking if it was me knowing that I only had... Like, we all only have a certain amount to live anyway. Yes. Right? So if you think that if your hope is in this world and that you're going to have a nice retirement and, mm -hmm. you're gonna, you know, really, this is our battleground. Yeah. And that I should be thinking about my eternal reward yes. when I'm living my life every day. Yes. Okay. All well, those are all good. All right. We're doing good. And we have one more. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So... Why don't you use this when faced with temptation? Yes, Tola. You should avoid eye service. Avoid eye service, yes. Men pleaser. Yeah, be a men pleaser, yeah. Okay, all right. Anything else? Yes? Uh, Every situation will give thanks to God. All right, amen, yes. All right, so these are all good. You've got the picture. And this is what Jesus is doing. He's relying on the scriptures as he's faced with the temptation. And uh, we're so glad... Uh, uh, to, I'm glad to hear you say these things. It's good. And you've taught half the lesson, so I don't have to. Okay, so there are hundreds of passages like these. The Bible calls us to arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And uh, Talbert, in the book that we're following for this lesson, says, The better we know God's words, the more skillful swordsmen we will be as well. So in temptation, we can use the Scriptures just as Jesus did. All right, so in his teaching, how did he use the scriptures? So I'm going to give you the whole passage here. I've highlighted a couple of things in the passage, and we'll talk about them as we go through here. Uh, and I have, uh, just before we get into it, I have a quote from, again from Talbert. He says, Christ repeatedly made God's words in the Old Testament the ground and authority of his teaching, both to establish his own doctrine and to correct the errors of others. So here is Jesus teaching the Pharisees on the doctrine of marriage. I'll just read the passage and then we'll just highlight a couple of things. Some Pharisees came to Jesus uh, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. Uh, and there's a lot of things we could say on, some, uh, on these things as I think about it, but... Uh, now, I, I have a note in here, a suggestion about why did the Pharisees bring up this question? Okay, why are they, you know that they're always trying to trap him, and there was an observation made in this book that I had never considered before, and I think it's quite possible. The Pharisees may have been attempting to trap Jesus to getting into trouble with Herod Antipas. There's some thought that this conversation happened in Galilee, where Herod was in control. Remember, John the Baptist had, had publicly rebuked Herod for taking his brother's wife. So, uh, so there's possibility that the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus to say something that would get him in trouble with Herod. Uh, that's 
that's uh, speculation, but it seems to be a bit of a, somewhat a reasonable speculation. So interesting observation. Anyway, notice how Jesus begins his answer. Have you not read? So he is basing his answer on the scriptures. Have you not read? He's pointing them to the scriptures. And uh, Jesus trusted what God said. So here's, and I quoted here, God made them male and female, uh, or I highlighted it in red. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So there's more than just the doctrine of marriage that is supported by these words from God. So if we trust these words, what other issues are settled? I put in the note, so I have uh, four things that are written down. The divine origin of man. God made them male and female. So, so man didn't originate from some convoluted process of random evolution and so on and so forth. God, uh, the divine origin of man. The divine creation, creation of gender distinction. It's a hot topic in our day, uh, but this is clearly what the Bible teaches us. We can rely on this. So we don't have to... We don't have to give in to the pressure of the world. The Bible tells us what we need to know about what man is. The sanctity of marriage. Man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. They too shall become one flesh. It is a, it is a, um, a relationship that, that is unique in, amongst all the relationships of the world. And so it's very important to, to keep it uh, holy. And then the permanence of marriage is God's plan. We find that in in these words as well. Jesus is deriving that from the original statement of the scriptures. Now, uh, the main point for our discussion is this. We can rely on God's words as a basis for our own view of the subject. Uh, so, uh, any comments on this? I, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on the specifics of this doctrine. There's many things that we could add in. But uh, I mainly are want, I'm wanting to show you how Jesus is simply relying on on the scriptures as a basis for his teaching. So anything, Tola? I want to ask, like, if you don't have the word of God in your heart, mm -hmm. it will be very difficult for you to resist temptation and hold the word of God. That's right, yes. It's good to know the word of God. It's, too, it's good to have it in our head. Yes. But the best is to have it in our hearts. That's right. <laughs> if you don't have it in our hearts, it will be very difficult yes. to resist temptation to the world. That's right. And you know what Tola is saying there? That's very important because uh, it's one thing to read it. It's one thing to know it intellectually. But to really, to rely on it. This is what we're talking about here. To rely on it, it you, know, you have to trust it. This is faith. This is living by faith. Now, you know, we're all faced with temptations. We, uh, there are times when we have g gone wrong in our lives. For one person, it's one area. For another person, it's another area. Wherever you are, you can get back into a re right relationship with God, but you do have to submit to his word, confess your faults to him, and uh, not to anybody else necessarily, and get things right with God, and then, and then walk with him. And that, that's all, uh, Gordon. The point you were making earlier, and this here, like, <clears throat> not leaning onto our own understanding, yeah. but like I found it with unsaved family, yeah. that they want to get you into those arguments, yeah. like the male and female, or the yeah. homosexual, or whatever, and you just quote a Bible, yeah. and say, I don't have an opinion. Like God's got it. Yeah. said it, and yeah. that's it. I don't. Yeah. But they want you, you can yeah. get yourself into trouble and spoil your witness somehow yeah. by arguing. You know, and often, you know what, this is a thing that happens, and uh, this is something a little aside. When people are witnessing, when you're witnessing somebody, they'll say, yeah, but what about? They'll try to bring up some. And when I was younger, I used to go chase down those rabbit trails. The thing is, it's really not an issue. You know, that's really not the issue. You have to just keep turning them back to what they need to hear and uh, try to stay out of those rabbit trails. You know, say, well, well let's save that for another time. You know, we'll... Was there anything else I thought I saw my saw a hand? Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next one uh, in teaching. He's, another passage that is uh, brought up here is Mark 9, 42 to 40, 48. So let me read that passage to you. 
Whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if with a heavy millstone hung around his neck he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than uh, having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone, he says, will be salted with fire. Now, that's quite a statement. Now, what he's doing here, uh, he is teaching them about, about the... Uh, danger that people put themselves into with temptation, but he cites the danger as God's eternal punishment in hell. And he, he uses, he's actually using Isaiah 66, 24 to teach us. This. this is the very last verse in the book of Isaiah. Interesting how it closes. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, says God, for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. That's quite, a, that's quite a statement. And I, you know, as you think about that, that's how the book of Isaiah ends in God's providence. Anyhow, so Jesus isn't appealing to personal knowledge here. He's appealing to the scriptures. So everything he's teaching, again, is what we're saying, is it rests on the scriptures. Any comments on this one before we move on to the next? Rob. Um, I've always read that this is, he's using, um, well, I hate to say it, but figurative language, but there's a term for it in literature, hyperbole, hyperbole uh, uh, contrast, so he's not really telling us to literally pluck out our eye. No, yes, yeah, that part is hyperbole, yes. Yeah, yes. yes, yes, So, yeah. Except, but it enforces, by using that language, it enforces the, the importance of the right. passage, I guess. right. Right, he's, he's, that part of the statement is, uh, is a figure of speech, yes. Uh, it doesn't mean that he doesn't mean it's unserious. It means you need to take serious steps. All right, uh, yeah, I was focusing on the quotation and not, <laughs> not thinking about the rest because of it. Because sometimes I know when I was a new Christian, I was sort of like, like what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, what does this mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, we do, we do, I mean, the Lord and all speakers use rhetorical Techniques, so so there is such a thing as a, uh, a an exa a, an exaggeration for effect. What is he saying? Look, if if you are if you uh, uh, if you know if your hand he says causes you to stumble, so you you know you you know you you just have a hand that reaches out and takes things off the store shelf without paying, <laughs> you know, then cut off your hand. You know, well, he's not saying literally cut off your hand, but he's saying you need to take steps, take this seriously. All right, I think I had one back here, Kerry, so I'll go to that first and then Lee. Uh, I'm just wondering, like, when Jesus says the worm does not die, does that, I have an image in my head of people covered in maggots or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the picture. The picture of the worm is the spirit. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. That's better. Yeah, that, that's a little like, oh, what are we talking about here? All right, okay, uh, Lee. Yeah, just to talk about, like, the figurative language, like, there's no amount of self-mutilation that's going to get rid of the sin problem right. that you have. Right, exactly. So, so yeah. yeah, so that that's the clue to the, that this is hyperbole. Yeah. Like, you know, you could, you know, can you imagine a bunch of Christians who are struggling with sin and, you know, they've got both, they're walking around with both hands cut off, both eyes plucked out. <laughs> You're like, you know, we'd be a mess. That's not what he's saying. You know, that's not what he's teaching he's us. He's showcasing the, the seriousness. He's talking about the seriousness. That's right. Okay, that's good. That's a good thing to say. All right, so let's move on to the next one. Jesus using the scriptures in controversy. So the first one, I've actually, uh, we're only, I think, going to look at two today. I have one more. Because it's a controversial passage, it may take a little bit to explain. I have fairly long notes on this. Okay, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling uh, in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den. So, um, oops, where am I? Okay, here I am, okay. 
So, just a little context. He is in the temple. He's in the court of the Gentiles. And the high priest Annas, who we'll, we will run into, at the, he's one of the ones that Jesus has taken before during the uh, trial. Uh, Annas was a devious, very shifty character. Uh, he and I think five of his sons and one of his sons-in-law, Caiaphas, at various stages occupied the uh, position of high priest for like 30 years running, something like that, uh, right in this time frame. Annas himself, I think, served a couple of times as high priest. Uh, he always ran afoul of the Romans. He was, he was really a crook. I mean, he was just, it was all about money for Annas. And he is the guy who came up with this marketplace. So in the temple, <clears throat> they're offering sacrifices for various reasons. And people would come to worship, and they'd offer a sacrifice. So Anna says, hey, let me make it convenient for you. I'll put a market of temple-approved lambs and whatever, goats and doves and whatever, right here in the temple. You don't have to bring it all the way from wherever you are. You can come and just buy it here at the temple. Oh, you'll have to exchange it for temple money. There'll be a fee for that, yes. And then, <laughs> then you can buy the thing with the temple money, and then... Uh, and uh, yeah, it costs us something to take care of him, so it'll cost you a little bit. But you know, and that was his scheme. So he made money on the money exchange. He made money on the animals, and the whole in the court of the tent, the Gentiles, it was just a bedlam, okay, going on there. So that you know, if a Gentile wanted to worship, he could only be in the court of the Gentiles. If he's worshiping, he might offer an animal from that market. But they're, you know, they're crowding him out. Is the idea all right, Christy? So I heard that, like, because Caesar's fix or whatever was on the coins, that they weren't acceptable. That's right. So we all accept him in exchange for the was temple it money. Really unacceptable, or did they just say that? So They're just saying it's like, Annas. He's just trying to make a deal. He's trying to they make gave their tithes. Yes. They didn't have to exchange it. They could just give the normal money. I'm not sure about that, but he. But basically, he's uh, he's getting a cut every time there's an exchange of money. That still happens today, by the way. The bank or somebody, the government, for sure, is getting a cut. So it's the way it works. That's the way. <laughs> Annas was very modern. All right. Okay. Well, let's not get hung up on the details. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. Let's not get hung up on the details. All right. So, okay. So uh, this was again designed for the convenience of uh, the worshippers. I put in the notes. Get your sacrifice here. You know, you know, blinking signs and all this. All right. And the prophet of the priests. And this is really. It was, and so it's obviously it's a corrupt thing. But if you wanted to worship at the temple, you had to put up with this. All right? And the sincere Jews put up with it during this period. All right. So this is quoting partly from Isaiah 56, 7. Even those I will bring uh, to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Okay, that my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's where that comes from. But you are making it a robber's den. So Jesus is picking up here, Jeremiah 7, verse 11. Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your sight? Okay, so Jesus is picking up on these two passages. His protest is based on those scriptures. Now notice the part I highlighted in the text. He's targeting both the buyers and the sellers. Okay, so it's very important to note that. He is targeting both of them. And note that the market uh, uh, occupies the court of the Gentiles. And uh, the quotation in Mark adds this. Is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. So he adds something extra as in Mark, where he quotes a little bit further. Uh, my house, in Isaiah 56, 7, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Mark quotes the whole thing there. All right. So, uh, Talbot says, Jesus was neither spiritualizing or moralizing these texts. He was making authoritative modern applications and taking authoritative actions grounded in the assumption that God's words are timelessly trustworthy. He said, look, this is what God's house is supposed to be. And he was taking his action. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He drove out those who were uh, selling the doves. And uh, by the way, this is the second time he had done it. We have a re record of a similar event in John's Gospel at the beginning of his ministry. And it's um, 
uh, uh, but a very similar uh, circumstance, but there's many things about it that are different, including the placement in John's Gospel. So we have concluded that there are two events, one at the beginning, one at the end. This is the one at the end. And he is using the scriptures here as the basis uh, for what he's doing. All right? Any comments or questions now beyond that? And Gordon? You, you mentioned it was controversial. It's con it was a controversy. It was used in a controversy. It's not controversial for okay, us. Okay. Not controversial for us. But he's using it in a controversy. He's using the word of God in a controversy. This settles the question. He's showing that they are, they are wrong in God's eyes to be doing these things. All right, and Lee? I'm assuming he's correcting people's thinking around there too because uh, it's not, I, I don't know how, like, a lot of these people probably couldn't read or whatever. Or I'm, I'm not sure. I, I imagine they would, they're, they're meant to go there in humility and faith and offer these yeah. sacrifices. Like, they're, they're changing it into, like, just this going through the motions. And I know, it seems like these people just come in there, I know I have to pay X amount of dollars. And I don't like Yeah, well, people are going along with the system yeah. because, it, and it's like, you know, there's things that come and get imposed on us by the government that I don't particularly like. I uh, can't think of anything right off the top of my head. But, they, you know, because it's the way it's done, it's just easier to go along. And so you go along. And, and, uh, and so Jesus is condemning both buyer and seller here. I think the buyers and sellers, some of those people would have to stop and think, oh, yeah, maybe I should get my animal somewhere else and not feather the pockets of Annas. You know, because it's, they couldn't prevent you from doing that. They're just saying, well, it's so much easier. Okay, mm -hmm. you see. All right, yes, Rob. Well, they were supposed to bring their own out of their own li livelihood and their own stock. That's and, right. You know, so it was like, yeah, but money is a medium of exchange. And so you could, you could bring money mm -hmm. and buy a lamb. It's the same thing as bringing your own lamb, you see. So suppose, yeah. that's the whole idea. So... Yeah, but anyway, it shows there's a lot of things that could be said, again, but what we're focusing on here is Jesus is simply relying on God's words to take a very public stand. That's how he's doing that. I, one other... Sure. Like, what... I don't remember what the response was. I don't think it does it get into it at all. Like, that seems like that would be pretty outrageous for somebody um, to walk in and... Yeah, I hear you. I, one of the passages... No, this is what Matthew... This is where Matthew... Matthew, this this one is Matthew 21. I I think what we read this morning. Okay, so this is actually the passage we read last week in our Sunday, uh, in our scripture section in the morning service. So uh, we read later on in the passage where they where they came to said, "By what authority are you doing these things?" And he says, "All right, before I answer that, let me ask you a question." Okay, so I think that's the response. Okay. So anyway, but you have to go back to the whole chapter. We're focusing, okay, we're really tightly focused here on what we're saying about trusting in God's word. Okay, so one more, and this is a Sabbath controversy. And uh, we've got time, I think. I was just, see, it's always a dance as I'm studying this out. How much should I put in? There's still more uh, to do, but anyway. So here we go, Matthew 12, 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of the grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath. We've got you, you see. That's what they're saying. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God, and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or, he says, have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Not a sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent. All right, so we're going to have to think our way through this passage. Uh, first of all, what the disciples were doing as they're going along the way, there was a grain field next to them. This is obviously the fall of the year or late enough in the year that the heads of grain are ripe and they are breaking off the grain. They're rubbing it in their hands. They're blowing off the chaff. They're eating the seeds. Uh, I, I have done this once in my life. Has anybody else ever done this? Okay. If you, if you grew up on the prairies, uh, and had farmers in your family, you can do this. Okay, so we were out in the fields. There was a wheat wheat field. Broke off a head of wheat, rubbed it in my hands, blew off the 
chaff and I ate the raw wheat. I don't know, maybe you warped me for life, I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, okay, so this was permitted. The law permitted somebody, if you, you weren't to, if somebody were, you know, obviously a guy came in and harvested your whole field, that would be theft. Okay, but if you're walk, they're walking along the way and they're hungry, they can take a few heads of grain and use it to, to uh, assuage their hunger. So that was permitted in the law. Right, Lee, you're wanting to ask something on yeah, that? Yeah, maybe I don't want to get too much into the weeds. Like, I, I was always confused about like the, the Old Testament Sabbath laws, like whether the between necessity and... Uh, and it seems we're like going to work our way through that question, so hang okay. on, hang with me on that. Okay, okay? so, uh, all right, so... The Pharisee, now see, the, the idea, the action is permitted under the law. The action itself is permitted under the law. The Pharisees are saying, no, no, only on six days of the week. You can't do it on the Sabbath. Okay? The Sabbath trumps that law is basically what they're saying. So then Jesus responds. Notice how he's, he brings up Scripture in his response. Have you never read? Or have you not read, rather? Okay? So, uh, he says that in both verse 3 and verse 5. So, the precedent of David. Now, this is not related to the Sabbath. David, it's not, the issue isn't the Sabbath. But the issue is that David did something that was reserved for the priests alone. He ate the showbread in the tabernacle. It was actually the leftover showbread. Each week, they're to come in with, a, uh, with fresh loaves, and they take the old loaves, and those were reserved for the priests. They could eat them. All right, so you got weak old bread if you got to be a priest, okay? So that's how it worked. But David comes, uh, he's in flight from Saul. His men are famished. They, they took off without any meals, and they're hustling away. And, and, um, and David says to the priest, is there anything here? You got any food here? Well, all we got is this showbread. You know, it's, and he says, well, give that to me. Well, what are they going to do? <laughs> Here's the guy with the sword. What are they going to do? or men with swords. I think they also gave him Goliath's sword, if I remember right. And um, they, uh, in any way, he ate the showbread. In any, in any case, he ate the showbread. So, the scripture does not condemn David for this. It's just recorded in the scriptures. There's nobody who says boo throughout all of the biblical revelation to David, or about David. There's nobody who rebukes David, nobody says anything about it. And the Pharisees themselves would not, they knew this story, they wouldn't condemn David for what he had done. Okay? He, he clearly broke the law. The law said only the priests get to eat this bread. He broke that law. All right? So David, Jesus just brings it up. He says, look, here's, here's David. He did something that was not lawful for him to do. And God didn't condemn him for it. Now, what's the reason? Well, God makes laws to serve men, not men to serve laws. Based on human need, the law was not applied. It, that did not invalidate the law, by the way. So, quote from uh, Talbert here, God didn't create people just so there would be someone to keep his rules. He established rules to help keep his people. Now, uh, the precedent shows that the Pharisees had not thought through their understanding of the law in general. Okay, so their understanding of the, their look at the Sabbath, God says you can only do this on the Sabbath, and then they expanded that to become the overarching, the one law that rules them all. That drove so much of their controversy with Jesus and how they ordered life. All right? So, now, let's move on from that to the present, to their time, example of, of the priests in the temple. Have you not read in the law... Every Sabbath day, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent. What are they doing in the Sabbath day? They are doing their normal work. On the Sabbath day, they are offering the morning and evening sacrifice. They are bringing sacrifices to the altar. They are going through all the ritual. You read about the things that the priests had to do in order to offer those sacrifices. Uh, there were ritual washings, putting on of priestly garments, taking off of priest, priestly garments, uh, slaughtering the animals, burning a portion of it on the altar, or maybe the whole thing on the altar, pouring the blood out in a certain way, da-da-da-da-da. They're doing their normal work on the Sabbath day. Right? The priests were not in violation of the Sabbath by doing that, even though they're doing their normal work. This showed that the Pharisees did not understand the purpose of the Sabbath itself. And so then Jesus quotes 
Hosea 6.6 6, to close the argument. They missed the whole point of the law. Hosea 6.6, 6, for I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. All right? So, and by the way here, that started, when you read that, notice the quotation in Matthew, I desire compassion and not a sacrifice. Okay, so the translation in Hosea, this is a little explanatory, I, desire, I delight in loyalty. You say, wait a minute, how do you have loyalty and compassion? They, those don't quite make it. All right, so the word here in Hebrew is chesed. Okay, so often translated loving kindness, uh, the mercies of God, loving kindness of God. So uh, loyalty is, is a meaning to that word, and the translators, unfortunately, I don't really like that translation in Hosea, but that's what they chose, the New American translators. But it, it, it is closer to the idea of compassion, loving loyalty. I delight in people's uh, uh, loyal, loving loyalty to me rather than sacrifice, so walking with God. That's just explaining the translation. Okay, Christy? I think of the verse in Samuel where he rebukes Saul too, and he says, I delight in, the Lord delights in um, obedience rather than sacrifice. That's right, I delight in obedience rather than sacrifice. That's right, so it's that relationship with God that is more important. So let's now think through all of this. Do the disciples get to decide the law just because they are hungry? Okay. They're going by this field, it's the Sabbath day. Are they, just because they're hungry, are they starving? No. no, they're just, I mean, they could hold on. If they held on, they would get somewhere, they'd have a meal, right? So they're eating this grain on the Sabbath. So they're not, Jesus isn't saying, look, they get to set up, you know, if you're hungry, it's okay, you can do whatever you want. He's not saying that. Okay. What is the problem with this situation? The problem is the Pharisees have added to the Sabbath law. They're making the Sabbath law say more than what it actually says. So they're prohibiting all kinds of things, which we've talked about many times in our discussions, what Orthodox Jews, even today, who are the children of the Pharisees, what they say about what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath day. So the fact is the disciples had not violated the Sabbath law, just the Pharisees' tradition. Jesus simply relied on the trustworthiness of Scripture to show that the Pharisees didn't understand the law and their hearts were looking to attack violations of the law as they saw it in order to stoke, stroke their own egos. And so, uh, so that, that's, how, that's thinking through that passage. Any, any questions on that, Maureen? I was just going to say, this is sort of like an example of what Tola was saying about the Pharisees had the law sort of in their head, but not quite. That's right. But it wasn't in their heart because they didn't really understand or believe it. That's exactly right. So, That's so, exactly right. So they actually didn't, couldn't live their lives according to God's law because it wasn't really something in their heart. That's right. Exactly. That's that's right. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe it was deliberate on the part of the Pharisees because some inclination will have told them that really, yeah. when Jesus pronounced is divine. Yeah. Because when they say Pharisees, Sadducees, it's mm -hmm. not one person. Yeah. There could be many that are posting different questions at different times. Yes. But it's only Jesus has given them the orientation and given the they ought to have maybe it's deliberate on their part to ignore yeah. those facts. Yeah. That only one person against so many of them. Yes. And he doesn't think through before he says something and it's divine. He will have thought that is divine. Yeah. But they never thought in that direction. That's right. And and because of their because they had made such a big, uh, really, I've often said, they, the Pharisees made the Sabbath an idol. And so, if you did anything that violated your idol, they, they attacked you. And Jesus is simply saying, and, and here in this passage, let's see, something greater than the temple is here. Okay, so, so and he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And they're not really acknowledging that. So he is showing them they don't understand the law. They understand that God didn't intend the law to be a rigid uh, uh, structure to strike people down if they stepped out of line. But what God was after was people who followed him with their hearts. And so, and so their expansion of the law was illegitimate. And, and they, they couldn't see through that because they made the Sabbath such a big deal. 
All right. Any last questions? We've just about out of time. So any last questions? Rob. Uh, the King James says, instead of loyalty, it says mercy. Yes. Like yeah. mercy. And I, I like that better, yeah. actually. Yeah. But it's, it's, interestingly, it does say it in Matthew and Hosea. It uses the word yeah, they're just translated the same. Yeah. Translators are, you know, sometimes they make cho word, choice, uh, word choice differences just to be different, I think. <laughs> they, sometimes they goof. I think they did in this case. But anyway. All right, okay, so let's close with a word of prayer, and we'll be finished. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had today. Help us ourselves, each one, to just simply rely on your word, uh, following the example of our Lord Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.